Hi, just before we begin, I wanted to take a short minute to talk to you about how you can get your hands on something new from the Welsh History Podcast. Thanks to Tee Public, we have a new online store. From t-shirts, stickers, hats, and everything in between, you can find them there. So have a look around, and you can do that at Tee Public, that's T-E-E public.com forward slash stores forward slash Welsh dash history dash podcast. Thanks everybody and on with the show. Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 148, The Rise of Jasper Tudor. A few weeks ago, I talked about the death of Edmund Tudor and the victory of the Yorkists. In the wake of Love Day, of course, there was open hostility on all sides. Years of animosity would not easily be set aside, and this just was something that you couldn't expect changing just because the king desired it, or the king wanted it, or the king was hoping for it. It had to be something that the sides had to agree to. And there was no real reason for any side to give up what they had or the desire of what they wanted. You couldn't look easily at them and say, okay, I'm done. I've got what I wanted. I'm happy. Or I'm happy to give up what I lost. That just was never going to happen. The two sides have put too much into this and have fought too hard to suddenly turn around and be happy to give up what they've had to make the king happy effectively. And realistically, the queen and York continued to jockey for position even after this so-called love day, even within days of this so-called love day. This all benefited various members of the nobility in different ways, and for Jasper Tudor, as an example, he went from being the second son of a former queen and a commoner half-brother to an ineffective king to being one of the most powerful men in Britain in a very short time. Jasper seemingly used his position to create what he could under the circumstances. He played politics during this time generally fairly well, key point being during this time protecting his brother's family in Pembroke, setting up security across South Wales, hoping to protect his new holdings from the Yorkist opponents across from him in both Wales and in England. In order to protect his holdings, he went around securing them through various means. In the case of Tenby, as an example, he would put new six-foot-wide walls around the town to keep the town protected as it lay near the mouth of the Bristol Channel. Of course, it's a key point for observing shipping in and out of that channel, and has always been a key point for Wales from the south. Jasper also was tasked with punishing those who were likely responsible for the death of his brother. Sir William Herbert, the Yorkist ally, who had been collecting men in the valleys of north of Cardiff, continued to carry on his opposition to the Lancastrians. Herbert, whose grandfather was David Gam, who we mentioned earlier a few weeks ago, was, along with his allies, brought to justice by Tudor. Among those he captured were William, Walter Devereux, and members of the Vaughan family to the courts in Hereford in March of 1457, But if Jasper thought he would gain revenge or at least a measure of justice, he would be proven wrong. The fear for those who supported the Queen was that the attacking Herbert and company would be seen as a direct attack on York. So likely, against their own desires, they would have to be careful and cautious. And even as they wanted to take out more vengeance they would have to mollify themselves with only minor punishments. Herbert and the Vaughns, as an example, were pardoned, and only Devereux saw some jail time, and he himself spent ten months in prison for the crime. 
This put a huge stake through any sight of peace between Jasper and the Yorkist. He was now fully in the camp of the queen. While he continued to build strength in mid- and southwest Wales, his allies continued to control the eastern borderlands. York continued all through 1459 and 58 to gain followers from areas around Wrexham. Denby, in particular, was and remained an important place for the Yorkist cause. Denby had been a key link to Ireland, a place that York had been sent to pacify in the decades previous. He remained influential in Ireland, and having this connection between this fortified town and Ireland meant that it was a key position for the two sides. Effectively, even though, I mean, if you look at the map, Denby itself is placed in the northern eastern part of Wales. It's not on a coast, but even with all of that, it becomes a key point. It is a key point of contact between those who had been in Ireland and in England at this time. If you're unfamiliar with Denby, it's a town founded by Edward I in 1282 after the conquest. It was a castle that had a traditional English town, all of which were surrounded by walls. It is in the middle of what were the borderlands of Gwynedd and Powys, in what would be called the Four Cantrifts during the independent principality period. If you travel there today, the area is a agriculturally rich land with rolling hills, which are not extreme, but rather pleasant. While there are larger hills in the area that overlook it, it is much more pastoral and easy to travel compared to the western part of Gwynedd, where mountains range, obviously. Denby itself, in the medieval period, was initially positioned on a hill overlooking a more pastoral area, as you would imagine a castle could be easily defended in a place such as that. The area had bounced around various marcher lordships from Lincoln to Dispenser and finally to the powerful Roger Mortimer in the 14th century. The Mortimers, who we've mentioned many times in the past, would control the area until their fall from grace during the Glyndwr Revolt, and in so doing, the area fell back into the royal family. As descendants of the Mortimers, the castle was eventually granted to Richard of York in 1425. The original town was much closer to the castle, within the walls that surrounded it, and seemingly kept it safe. The town had fallen to Owen Glyndwr during the rebellion, but the castle was never defeated. It was thought to have started life as a Roman fort, likely protecting troops heading to Carnarvon, another British Roman fort. The town started to grow beyond the walls fairly quickly after its establishment, as two-thirds of the town was positioned outside of the walls, which even in the medieval period this was the case, which had been built to protect the castle, obviously when they were protecting the original town site. This meant that Denby was an important location both for Richard of York and for his Lancastrian opponents. Controlling this fort controlled a key access point into North Wales. Obviously, this was positioned in an area which was the easy travel position between Chester to Anglesey, this would obviously be a key point of invasion back in the days of the Glyndwr Rebellion and in the days of the Principality when Llewellyn the Last was fighting Edward I and had been a position and a situation going back probably even to the Roman period where troops would travel along those coastlines, avoiding the more difficult areas to travel and to traverse. So you can understand why it would be such an important part of York's land holdings, and of course, because it's in an area of the Marcher Lordships, would be an important position to take. So, getting back to where we were, the desire of the Lancastrian side in 1459 was to root out the influence that the Yorkists had on the Welsh marches in particular. If they could drive them out of that area, it would firm up the Queen's support from the Midlands and act as a bulwark against Yorkist influence in the north and in Ireland. Once again, the tensions ran high in the land. 1459 was a year of a slow build. The small steps that the king had likely hoped would mollify each side 
had been like the equivalent of putting a plaster on a boat leak, while ignoring the five other leaks that appeared. As summer became autumn, once again, confrontation appeared. On September 20th, Warwick returned from Calais at the head of a few hundred men looking to link up with York, who was once again coming into his possessions in Wales, with his Welsh supporters in tow. From the north, Lord Salisbury was moving around 5,000 men south to meet with York at Ludlow. Lancastrians had hoped to stop this meeting, and they hoped by doing so to defeat one of the major forces coming south before they could do any more damage. The Yorkists were hoping to use their military experience to once again overcome the larger royal forces. Salisbury had to know that the Queen and her military leaders would be prepared for this move south and wanted to avoid that link-up. The royal army was led by an elderly James Touchette, known as Lord Aldley, the Chamberlain of South Wales. Aldley was able to gather a force of estimated to be from as low as 8,000 men to as high as 13,000. Historian Dan Jones felt the report that Salisbury was coming for a fight were accurate, but others have contended that York had not meant for a conflict to start here, and it was more about a show of force. Hi, I'm Mark Machado, broadcaster and Sri Lankan cricket fan. Every week, Estelle Vazu, Devon and myself will drop several episodes of Sri Lanka on 99.94, keeping you up to date on the latest from the Sri Lankan cricketing world. If you want to know what Hasaranga is up to, where Chabri Athapattu scored her runs, or what Narosha Dickweller has been discussing behind the stumps, then make sure to watch or listen to Sri Lanka on 99.94. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, on YouTube and on the 99. 9.94 app. Join the Shrunken Crooked Conversation and get involved. A news story gets shared by a friend on social media or you catch a tweet that really makes your blood boil. But how do you separate fact from fiction? That's the premise behind Disinformation, a 10-part series from Evergreen Podcasts and Emergent Risk International coming this fall. Tune in to Disinformation wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, don't believe everything you read. The Queen's forces were men from the West Midlands, thus were familiar with the area and would have further incentive to fight to protect their own lands, not just because of royal power. It also does not take a genius to see why this would motivate them. Along with that, so much of the royal power was now concentrated in the Midlands at this stage, it would be an obvious base of operations. On the morning of September 23rd, Lord Aldley's scouts found evidence of Salisbury's men moving in the area. At Bloor Heath, on either side of Hemp Mill Brook, the two sides lined up in a standoff said to be about a mile long. It, and of course, it would have been obvious to all sides which had the larger army, as of course the royalists dwarfed their Yorkist opponents. But Salisbury's men had the confidence of having won the last confrontation and the experience of having fought in numerous wars in France. As had happened previously, York's more battle-hardened side won the day again. Tactically, the royal forces once more fell to the strategy of their opponents. The Yorkists feigned an attack, drawing out the Lancastrian cavalry, who struggled across the brook, allowing their enemies the advantage. As you can imagine, with horses and men charging down through a river, it would then slow their progress, thus allowing arrows coming out of the tree on the other side of the brook to fire into them. These archers would do tremendous amounts of damage. The Lancastrians, of course, retreated and then decided to charge again, this time on foot, led by the obviously overmatched Lord Audley. As fierce fighting took place, he was then killed, as well as many of his men were either killed or captured meaning one of the Queen's commanders was now dead and the Yorkists had yet again won another engagement. The Northern Army, however, arrived after the bloody victory to their allies' 
York and Warwick. The Nevilles had won yet another battle, and the Queen must have been wondering what could change their circumstances. Yet, at the same time, the Yorkist forces were being bled dry. They only had 5,000 men. They had been bled quite a lot of men during that fight. It said up to 2,000 on both sides died in this battle, so it would have been a terrible loss for them, for a group that couldn't afford losses. A stroke of fortune for the Lancastrians came about because Neville had sent some of his forces north, inexplicably, allowing two of his sons, Thomas and John, to fall into the hands of the Queen, because, of course, she then defeated those troops. Salisbury's forces, which had already taken a beating in the last battle, had now been weakened once again and was now a shadow of what it had been coming out of the north when he fully reunited with York. The Queen's Pyrrhic gambit appeared to have worked. The royal army, now considerably stronger than York's, were marching towards him. Knowing it was actually not a good situation, York offered to confess loyalty and in return the king offered pardons for all who would join his standard over the next six days. On October 12th, at Ludlow Bridge, the two sides met again. This time the Yorkists melted away, feeling that the pardon was worth avoiding the battle and losing their life and their limb. Many of those within the Yorkist cause took the king at his word and took his pardon. Without an army to fight for him, York recognized what was left was not enough, and took his only choice, he ran for it. And of course, as he did, after the fight, the town of Ludlow was ransacked, and those of the Yorkist side that were abandoned, including his wife and their two children, would be at the mercy of the queen and her army. As would be the case across the War of the Roses, each side would take a measure to pay the other back for some sort of perceived slight, including destroying everything from their livelihood to peasants to anything not nailed down. One likely reason Portugal and Spain were able to make such inroads in exploration during this period was because the two biggest powers in Europe up until then, England and France, were too busy ripping each other and then themselves apart to care over the last 150 years. This meant that these two were able to become major powers on the waves in ways that may not have happened otherwise. Richard of York and his son Edward would flee to Wales, hoping to stay ahead of the Queen. They would do so just barely, while Warwick, the other uh, co-conspirator, fled back to Calais and Neville returned back north. In autumn, the royal party would call for a parliament, this time a victorious one for them, and they would come together in something which would be called the Parliament of Devils. Rather than trying to mend fences with the returned pardoned Yorkists, the queen and her allies went for the jugular. Revenge and righting perceived wrongs was now their only concern sharing the spoils of victory even while setting the stage for the fight to come was their effective achievement during this particular situation. The Parliament got its notorious name because it saw massive amounts of land seized from the Yorkists, which were then turned over to Lancastrian loyalists. This included much of the Marcher lands. One of the biggest beneficiaries was Jasper Tudor, with these new lands, including permanent holds of Denby, Jasper was now one of the most powerful men in England, with an absolutely staggering income for the time. He earned £1,500 a month from all of his various holdings in 1460, which would be the equivalent of making a million pounds a month today. As I said, it's a staggering amount. These are not the finances of a destitute former noble descended from a Welsh rebellion now. This was the holdings of one of the most powerful men in England or Wales, and he was expected to show this power by taking back the key castle of Denby. Jasper received financial aid he needed to take Denby on, in December of 1459, and he 
as part of the parliament, would swear a oath of loyalty in Coventry to the king. On January 5th, 1460, Tudor was officially commissioned as Master Forester of the Lordship of Denby, as well as the Constable of the Castle. Now he just needed to take it. He spent a massive amount of money and time to do so. In the end, he would spend about £650 trying to besiege the castle and take it back. And, of course, because of that doggedness and financial backing, he was able to do so. Tudor was also commissioned with the campaign to drive the Yorkists from Wales entirely, either by allegiance or execution. He was given the power to recruit anyone in Wales he needed to carry out his duties, and by March 3rd he was in Denby besieging the castle. It took two months for Jasper to achieve his goal of taking Denby as both the town and castle would fall to him, he now had his northern base of operations to flush Yorkists from the east to west. The damage caused to the castle would actually take about two years to repair, and it would cost about a thousand pounds. So even though it cost 650 pounds to attack, it took more than that to actually fix what they had done. And this would actually happen under a completely different regime. York and his son, meanwhile, fled to Ireland by this point and planned once again with their allies from across the channel on how they would be able to come back from their massive defeat. Once again, another one of these two warring sides had lost, but neither side was willing to give in. The queen might be in power, but Richard of York was, was far from being out of the race and out of the fight. In fact, a year from now, they will once again have yet another confrontation. In Wales, however, Jasper Tudor now stood at the pinnacle of his power during the War of the Roses. It was a height which he may have looked back on ruefully in the days to come. But either way, his place was now secured. His stepbrother's kingdom looked secure, and their enemies would have to rebuild before they would be a threat again. In the days to come, Jasper and the Queen would learn just how fast the Yorkists could climb back up their ladder of power. Obviously, it makes you wonder why they didn't learn from it from the first time this had happened. But nonetheless, that's where this story continues, and we will look further into this as we go. And uh, with that, I want to thank you all for listening. Thank you all for being a part of this podcast. I sure appreciate all the emails I get, all the contact I get, all the private DMs that ask questions, that talk to me. And it's sure one of those things that I really appreciate. It's one of those things about this podcast that makes me very happy because certainly I don't have all the answers, and certainly I will never have all the answers, so it's always nice to have someone who might know a bit more about it to talk about those kind of things, and certainly this has been very meaningful, so I hope it continues to be for you as much as it is for me, and with that, if you would like to contact me, you can do so at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com, or you can contact me on Twitter at Welsh History Pod or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. And if you would like to help contribute to the podcast, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash Welsh History. Thank you everyone for listening. Thanks once again. We'll see you next time. Until then, take care. Have a great day. Bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more info, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com. A news story gets shared by a friend on social media, or you catch a tweet that really makes your blood boil. But how do you separate fact from fiction? That's the premise behind Disinformation, a 10-part series from Evergreen Podcasts and Emergent Risk International coming this fall. Tune in to Disinformation wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, don't believe everything you read.